I came to Japan to work as a nurse in a post-surgical unit. Patients come from hundreds of miles away to get their operations here. The surgeons are known to be the best. But what we don't tell the patients, what we're not supposed to tell them, is that this one is haunted. There have been more than a few events that have raised the hair on the back of my neck, and some have sent me into hysterical screaming fits. There was that time a few months ago when a patient told me she saw a woman wearing a red kimono stand beside her bed and watch her all night. The patient didn't see her face as her black hair covered it. Really? Where did you see her? There. She was standing right there. The patient pointed at the curtains with a fearful face. I pulled back the curtains and showed her myself. All of the other beds were empty, and there was no visitors or staff in the room with her. As if that wasn't disturbing enough, a few weeks later a different patient said the same thing, when she had been left alone in the same room. Did you see her face? Oh, no, but I... I saw something else? The patient was trembling like a timid rabbit. What did you see? Her head was touching the ceiling. Her neck stretched up so high, almost like a snake. Now that made my skin crawl a bit. I looked at the watch. It was 2.30 in the morning and I was already tired from pulling a night shift back to back in a row. I gave the patient some medicines to help her sleep. Once she fell asleep, I decided to stay awake in that ward. The ward has six beds and only one of them has a patient. Rests were neatly made, white beds waiting for their temporary owner. I picked up a magazine and sat on a chair. After 15 minutes, I could barely keep my eyes open. I knew it was against hospital rules, but I still laid down on the corner side bed. It was honestly a quick and much needed nap. I don't recall the time when I heard running footsteps on the wooden floor. I got up thinking someone has come, but found no one. The ward was empty like before. The one patient was now snoring. Um, hello? Is anyone here? <laughs> My senses sharpened once I heard a woman's chuckling voice. The door was closed like I had left it a few moments back. This proves that the chuckle took place inside this room. Mrs. Tanaka? Are you sleepwalking again? <laughs> I couldn't turn on the lights as it'll wake up the ailing patient. The night lamp wasn't enough, so I switched on the flashlight on my phone. I saw a woman dressed in a red kimono standing right beside the door. She was far from me, so I couldn't see her face. But one thing I could tell was that she was staring at me with an ear-to-ear -ear smile. Ah! Oh, God! A sudden call from my mom almost gave me a heart attack. <sighs> Hi, Mom. Why are you still awake? Coco, are you alright? I'm perfectly fine, but why are you asking me this in the middle of the night? I... I had a very bad dream. Where are you? I'm at the hospital, Mom. Where else would I be? It's my night shift. Again. Did you say night shift? Yeah, why? I just saw you dozing off at your night shift and you were being watched by this strange woman. She wore this red kimono and was... Before my mom could finish her sentence, the call got disconnected. The phone dropped off from my shivering hands. With a slow, erratic heartbeat, I turned around where I saw the creepy woman a few seconds back. But she was gone. Uh, hello? What do you want? My eyes searched the entire room, but the woman was nowhere to be seen. Suddenly, my phone lit up once again. It was again my mom calling. I crouched down to pick up my phone and accidentally my eyes went towards the patient's bed. I could see a pair of red feet peeking under a red kimono. I jumped and looked above the bed. There was no one. What? Is this a nightmare? By now, I have started to lose my mind. I just saw a woman's feet under the bed, but when I looked up, there was no one standing beside the patient's bed. I crouched down once again, and now again, I saw those bare feet. The nails on the big toes were missing, revealing the red, puffy flesh underneath. 
I froze in that position. I was scared to look up when suddenly the feet started rotating to the back. A loud, horrifying sound of bones breaking took place with each movement of them. My voice died down in my throat. I knew what the patients kept saying about this ward is true, and I might not probably make it out of this room alive tonight. Just when I was on the verge of crying, the woman's neck dropped and her head, her head started to roll down on the floor. Like a snake, her long neck stretched to inhuman lengths and started coming at me. I got up and started running towards the opposite side. I aimed for the door, but before I could get out, I tripped and fell. (laughs) I laid on my back, knowing the laughter has come from a close distance. I didn't want to turn around, but I knew I have to. My head slowly arched back to catch a glimpse, and the woman's head was touching the ceiling. Her mouth was open, and blood was dripping from it. Her swirled, twisted neck moved side to side like a bobbing spring. I don't remember when I fainted. I naturally left that job at the hospital after my parents picked me up from the hospital. I was down with a fever. My grandma says Japanese people believe in this urban legend, which goes by the name Rokurokubi. They are said to be vengeful spirits roaming around at night. They love drinking their victim's blood, which made sense for her bleeding mouth. I don't know why she let me go or any other patient who stayed in that ward. There's still no news of her hurting anyone, but I guess she gets bored alone. Hence, decides to play with people for her entertainment. Whatever the reason may be, I'm never going near that hospital ever again. Hi, I'm Sylvia. A week ago, I had to move to Pittsburgh alone with my dad. My father had landed a job in the city, and so I had no choice but to come with him. I love him a lot since he has taken care of me after my mom died in a car crash when I was young, but moving to a new city during midterm is such a pain. It's not easy for me to make friends in a new city, especially if you're a nerd. My grades got me admission into one of the top school of the city. It was a nice campus, but the kids there were anything but nice. On my first day itself, I got the worst scare of my life. I had just finished class and went to the restroom, and when I went in, the door got locked from outside. I panicked and was trying to open it when the power went off, and I heard a loud, ghostly voice roaring from the other end. I tried to run when I hit my head against something and collapsed. The next thing I know was that I was in the locker room, surrounded by people and the principal of the school. I got up and they asked me what had happened, why I screamed and collapsed in the restroom. I told them what had happened. No one believed me. They thought I had some kind of daydream and asked me to relax and went away. Moments after they left, two girls, Karen and Amelia, came up to me and told me something that shocked me. They told me about Charlie, a psychotic, faceless man who roams the town and abducts girls and kills them. I was terrified to hear this, and that night at dinner I told my dad what had happened. Dad dismissed it, saying there's nothing like a faceless man. It's just some stupid urban legend and a bunch of lies. I couldn't sleep well that night. The creature's face kept coming into my mind. I came out to the balcony for some fresh air, and that is when I saw something horrifying. On the street in front of the house, I saw a man in a hooded jacket walking slowly in front of my house. And just before he passed our house, he stopped and looked up at me. I jumped in horror. It was the same faceless man Amelia and Karen had told me. I screamed in fear and ran inside. My dad came to me room and asked me what had happened. When I told him, he immediately went to the balcony to check, but there was no one there. He took me to him room and made me sleep next to him. I was shivering in fear. He consoled me and made me sleep. The next day when I went to school, I saw Amelia and quickly rushed to her to tell her what had happened, but she was lost in thought. When I shook her back to reality, she looked at me and broke down. Hey, Amelia, what happened? She was breathing hard and told me. Karen is missing. She went out last night and never came back. 
I was shocked to hear this and was about to ask something when the cops arrived at our school and wanted to meet us and question us regarding Karen. We told them all that we knew. We told the cops about the faceless creature and they just laughed it off, saying it was just an urban legend. After they left, I told her that I saw the faceless creature again in the night. Amelia had decided to go look for the creature. I told her that it was a bad idea, but she would not listen and left. I was worried for Amelia, and in spite of being scared, decided to help her. We took our cycles, did not tell anybody where we were going, and rode to the edge of town. There was an abandoned tunnel. Amelia told me that the creature lived in this place. We kept our cycle outside and went into the tunnel. I was scared, but Amelia was determined to find her friend. As we went in, the place got darker and darker. Just when we were about to switch on our mobile lights, we heard a scream. Let me go! No! We froze for a second. Amelia's eyes lit up. She told me that it was Karen's voice. We ran inside, but the tunnel split into two paths. We did not know where the sound came from, and we did not want to split and search either. We decided to take the path on the right and started walking inside. A little ahead, we saw a door, but it was locked. Amelia asked me to look for something to break the door open. I was looking for something in the dark when the door suddenly opened. I turned to look. There he was. Charlie. He had the ugliest face, completely wrinkled and scary. I screamed in fear and froze. He looked very angry and charged towards Amelia. Amelia was trying to fight back, but she was losing. I had to do something. I looked around and found an iron rod. I took it and hit his head hard. He collapsed and fainted. We quickly went in to rescue Karen and called the cops and ran out. The cops came after some time went into the tunnel and came back saying that there was no one inside. We were shocked to hear this. We had proved that the legend was true, but feared that Charlie was still out there and will be looking to take revenge on us. The cops asked us not to leave home for a few days and that they'd put out a notice for Charlie, the faceless man. That night when I was asleep, I heard the window of my room crack open. I looked and was shocked. It was Charlie. He was rushing towards me, saying, I will kill you! I jumped and screamed in fear and tried to rush out, but he grabbed my hand and pulled me. I fell on the bed and yelled out to my dad for help. Just when the door opened and dad came in with a shovel and hit Charlie in the head, we called the cops who came in and arrested Charlie. The town was finally free of that faceless psychopath. I didn't move beneath the covers, excitement coursing through my veins. The house was silent, and I knew that it was time. I slowly descended the stairs, careful not to make any noise and tip off my parents. I clutched tightly to the railing, afraid of what I might find. I reached the bottom of the stairs, my heart pounding in my chest. I would finally catch Santa. This year, I'd catch him putting presents underneath the tree just had to wait till I heard him, and then I'd spring out and catch him in the act. I waited, the silence around me growing louder with each second. Finally, however, I heard some noises from behind the corner. Excited, I sprang out from behind the corner. I gotcha! I... But my voice trailed off. Standing near the Christmas tree was something that horrified me, something that wasn't Santa. It was a tall, dark figure with pointed horns and a long whip. It turned towards me, its feet goat hooves and its face contorted into a sneer. Hello, Ryan. I screamed and ran back upstairs, jumping in bed and pulling the covers over my head. I stayed like that for what felt like hours until I decided to get up again. I crept back downstairs, my legs trembling as I went and peered around the corner. There was nothing there. I couldn't help but feel relieved. Maybe I had been dreaming and had never left my bed. The next morning, I had all but forgotten about the mysterious creature that stood in front of the tree. It was Christmas, and I eagerly opened my presents. There was a bike, a few new games, and strangely enough, a strange-looking toy that resembled a fidget spinner. 
A few days passed, and I decided to keep the fidget spinner with me as I made my way to school, despite the strange looks my parents had given each other when I opened it. School passed uneventfully, and I began to make my way home. I walked home, talking to my friends as I did. I swear, it was the craziest dream I ever had. A monster in the house on Christmas? Come on, man. Yeah, you must have been dreaming. Have you ever heard of Krampus before? Krampus? What's that? It's some crazy anti-Santa urban legend. You must have seen it somewhere. We continued walking until I saw something out of the corner of my eye. I stopped and strained to look in the direction I had seen it, but whatever it was had already gone. Still, I felt chills run down my spine. Whatever I had seen looked like it had horns, and I thought it looked awfully similar to what I had seen on Christmas. Suddenly, it began to snow incredibly hard. The clouds were so thick that we couldn't see anything in the distance. We ran towards the closest gas station, desperate to get out of the snow. Come on, man, keep up! I shouted behind my shoulder as I ran. When I didn't hear a response, however, I turned around. My friend was gone, and the snow whirled around me harder. What's going on? I kept running, my heart thumping in my chest, until I finally reached the gas station. For a moment, I felt relieved. The sign said the employee would be back in an hour, so I had time to take shelter from the snow and help myself to some snacks. I made my way to the racks of candy and snacks, almost too excited. Free candy for me, I guess. That stupid employee shouldn't have left the store unattended. I began to stuff the candy in my pockets, feeling overjoyed. But then, the lights went out, and I heard hooves on the ground. I froze in fear and looked up. Standing before me was Krampus. He sneered at me. You're not on the good list. I screamed and ran as fast as I could, Krampus's hooves thumping behind me as I ran. The snow was coming down harder and harder, making it difficult to see and almost impossible to run. I could hear Krampus' voice behind me, telling me I was in trouble. Faced with no other option, I finally stopped and fell to the ground crying. Above me, a large, shadowy figure appeared, but then I heard police sirens in the distance. With a surge of hope, I ran towards them and right into a group of policemen. Help me! Help me! Krampus is chasing me! Hold on, kid. What are you talking about? Krampus is chasing me. He's been chasing me since Christmas. He was in the gas station back there. See, I don't think he liked me stealing candy from the... I froze, realizing what I had said to the police. They looked down at me, sneering. Oh, something really freaked you out. Otherwise, you wouldn't have let slip that you stole some snacks, would you? Empty your pockets, kid. As I sat in a cell waiting for my fate to be decided, I heard devilish laughter from outside the jail. I leapt up, running to a single window in the cell. Outside in the snow, I saw the hulking figure of Krampus. His face was parted into an evil grin. Better be good next year, Ryan, or else there won't be a next year to look forward to. And with that, Krampus turned and vanished into the snow. I shuddered. I'm never going to steal or misbehave ever again. I know that Krampus is supposed to just scare kids, but after a close encounter with him, I can't help but feel like that's just an urban legend. The real Krampus looked all too willing to make sure I stay in line and kill me if I don't. <laughs>